Chapter 22, The Mesmerist. The scene that flickered into life was one Morrigan recognised. Proudfoot House Gardens on the day of the wondrous welcome. The camera panned shakily across the sunny lawn and bustling desert, uh, dessert buffet queue before zooming in on one or two people, Noel and Cadence. They stood near a huge green jelly sculpture, which Morrigan also recognised. Hawthorne was a few steps behind them, predictably piling his plate high with cake and pastries. Tacky, Noelle was saying on the screen. She poked the jelly, making a face. Horrid! Who serves this stuff at a party? We are not in nursery school. Right, Cadence replied. She'd been about to grasp one of the miniature jelly sculptures surrounding the bright green beer moth, but she changed her strategy at the last second and began spooning bread and butter pudding into her dish instead. Tacky, they're so stu... Mummy would have a fit, Noelle continued, talking over Cadence. Can you believe they are making us serve ourselves, Katie? It's Cadence, said the other girl, her face falling. Remember? Do you know how many servants the Wanderer Society employs? Noelle continues, as if she hadn't heard. heard. And they put on a buffet. Don't they know buffets are for poor people? Something flickered in Cadence's eyes, but was quickly gone. Yeah, exactly, she said, her hand hovering over a serving spoon, suddenly unsure. Forget it. Come on. Noelle dropped her own dish in the middle of the table, then snatched Cadence's pudding from her and tipped it upside down on the top of a delicious-looking chocolate fudge cake. She flounced out of the marquee, evidently expecting her friend to follow. Cadence took one longing look at her ruined pudding, breathing in deeply and made an abrupt turn, coming face to face with Hawthorne, who overheard everything and was trying not to laugh. Cadence leaned in close to Hawthorne and spoke in the same flat, husky voice Morrigan remembered her using on the twins' book trial and again on the society official at the chase trial. Don't you think that somebody ought to drop that big green thing right on her head? Hawthorne nodded solemnly. Morrigan turned to the real Hawthorne sitting beside her. He looked deeply confused. I don't remember that, he murmured. The scene changed to show Noel, Cadence and a group of children, including Morrigan, gathered on the front steps of Proudfoot House. The image was partially blocked by a blur of green leaves. Morrigan supposed that the camera and the person holding it had been hidden behind a tree. Is that your knack? Noel was saying to Morrigan on the screen, using big words. Cadence giggled helplessly, but not, as Morrigan thought at the time, at Noelle's cruelty. She kept glancing upward to where Hawthorne was positioning himself in the window with the jelly sculpture. She was laughing at what was about to happen to Noelle. I thought it must be wearing horrible clothes or being as ugly as a gutter rat. The real Morrigan, sitting in the Trolliseum stands, felt her face flush. It had been bad enough hearing that the first time, surrounded by a dozen strangers. Hearing it again in the presence of hundreds was close to torture. She slid down in her seat, trying to make herself invisible. The scene unfolded as Morrigan remembered it, climaxing with Hawthorne's magnificent jelly drop, at which point the Trolliseum exploded with laughter. Hawthorne grinned at Morrigan. Might not have been my idea, but it was still brilliant. Several rows in front of them, Noelle was glaring at the screen and shaking her head, her eyes narrowed to slits. She seemed utterly shocked. Obviously, she had no idea about the knack of her so-called friend. The next few minutes of film showed an incredible scene in which Cadence wandered around a posh street with a can of bright red spray paint in her hand, spraying rude words and pictures all along the immaculate white facades of the houses. By the time she was stopped by a brown-coated officer of the stink, almost the entire street had been vandalised. Stop right there! What do you think you're doing, you little menace? Art, she said flatly. Oh, art, is it? The officer asked, her eyebrows shooting up to her hairline. Looks like crime to me. Maybe I should slap you in handcuffs. Maybe you should slap yourself in handcuffs, Caden suggested. And the woman did, tightening them around her own wrists without a second thought. Cadence put the can of spray paint into her hands. Number 12 needs a bit more red. Have a nice day. Have a nice day, ma'am. With that final dead-eyed statement, the officer's gaze slid past Cadence like oil over water and landed in the glossy white front door of number 12, which didn't stay white for much longer. It was extraordinary the things Cadence can make people do. It wasn't nice, Morrigan thought. It wasn't decent or honest, but it was extraordinary. 
Morrigan had the uncomfortable experience of watching herself on the big screen yet again when Cadence's film showed the debacle of the chase trail in its entirety, from the stampeding rhinoceros to Fenn's daring rescue, to the moment of devastation when Cadence convinced the race official that it was she who ought to go through to the fright trial and not Morrigan. But the film went further. It showed another conversation, a very different one, in which Cadence convinced the official that one of the unicorns was in fact Pegasus in disguise. She pointed to its glowing silver horn, the perfect specimen of a genuine unicorn horn, she said. See? Someone's glued an upside-down ice cream cone to its head. I can't believe you didn't spot this earlier. And its wings have been tucked away. She pointed to the unicorn's flawless white flank, which was decidedly wingless. Morrigan was speechless. It was Cadence who'd gotten her through to the fright trial. She'd snatched away Morrigan's spot and then given it back to her, just like that. Why? Did she feel guilty? Scene after scene of manipulation and trickery followed. The film showed that it was Cadence who'd convinced the High Five twins way back at their very first trial at Pridefoot House to quit before they'd begun. She'd even persuaded Elder Wong to act like a chicken during her book trial, a scene that was received with uproarious laughter from everyone but Elder Wong. In the end, though, there were mixed reactions from the elders and certainly a lot of disapproving faces in the audience. They had no choice. Cadence Blackburn didn't just have a knack, she had a gift. A weird, mean gift, but a gift nonetheless. Number one, said Hawthorne as Cadence's name lit up on the leaderboard, bumping Anar down to second place, Hawthorne to fifth and Noel to eighth. There were only three groups of five to go. Morrigan had given up looking for Jupiter and started looking for an escape route. As soon as her failure and humiliation in the show trial were complete, she'd have to make a run for it. She hadn't seen Inspector Flintlock, but she felt certain he was somewhere in the stadium, biding his time, waiting for her to fall on her face so he could seize his moment and arrest her. At last, the final group was called. Morrigan made her way down to the arena gates with four other candidates. Hawthorne tried to go with her, but the ever-present clipboard-toting Wanderer Society official shooed him back to his seat. Morrigan was on her own. She stood in silence as the first three candidates performed. The girl with very long hair stood in the arena and, to the horror of the crowd, chopped off the lot just above her ears. Moments later, the hair began to regrow itself and in mere minutes had fully replenished to its former length. Morrigan, like everyone else in the audience, was amazed, but apparently not the elders. As Jupiter had predicted all the way back to the wondrous welcome, the girl did not make it into the top nine. She heaped both piles of hair, the one on the floor and the one on her head, into her pull-along wagon and moped out of the Trolliseum. A ballet dancer no place on the leaderboard. A boy who could breathe underwater, no place. Then it was Morrigan's turn. The one official led the gate open for her. She could leave now. The thought struck her like lightning. She could just turn and walk away. This was her last chance to avoid humiliation, followed by deportation from Nevermore, followed by certain death. And she could do it. She could spur herself what was bound to be the worst moment of her life so far, if she just turned and walked away. Do it now, she thought. Just go. Ready? A whisper in her ear. A squeeze of her shoulder. She looked up. A ridiculous ginger head. A pair of twinkling blue eyes. A wink. Yeah, I'm ready. She hesitated and then asked. One rush, desperate final attempt to get an answer before anyone else in the Trolliseum knew. What is it, Jupiter? What's my knack? Oh, that... He blinked owlishly at her, as if she'd just asked the least important question in the world. You don't have one. Then he stepped boldly into the arena, expecting her to follow. Captain Jupiter North presents Morrigan Crow of Nevermore. <laughs>